So I do want to talk about Memorial Day, but not so much. Um, I do want to honor our troops and honor all of that, what that stands for. But I want to ask you if memorials are important to you. Memorials can be funny things. You know, on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus, uh, Moses and Elijah came back and they had a vision. Jesus, his face turned white. Moses said, we need to put up three memorials. There's some, and, and then the father speaks through the cloud and says, essentially, be quiet. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. You don't make memorials like that. This is God in your midst, God in the flesh. How many of you think of yourselves as humble? Can I see your hands? Bill, okay. <laughs> How many of you think Bill is humble? <laughs> um, Charles Spurgeon said, humility is having the right estimate of yourself. The scripture tells us not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. It doesn't mean you don't think highly of yourself in the right way in light of what God's done in your life, but not than, than you ought to. Ted Turner said, if only I had a little humility, I'd be perfect. That was the man that founded, uh, that's a joke line. Um, um, there are two kinds of egotists, those who admit it and the rest of us. Malcolm Ford said, too many people overvalue what they are not and undervalue what they are. In our culture, there's a big emphasis on how special you are. Every one of you is a snowflake. Every one of you is so special. And there's this specialness that comes on. And I want to say we are. But I also want you to say, to realize that we can go, we can miss something and all that. Uh, I've said this before, but the population in India is approximately, or in China is about 1.3 billion people. So turn to somebody and say, you're one in a million. Now turn to them and say, there's 1,300 just like you walking around in China. <laughs> Go ahead. There's 1,300 walking around just like you in China. You are one in a million. But it's having a right estimate of who we are. Winston Churchill was not known for his humility. Uh, he's a great thinker, but he said, uh, we're all worms, but I'd like to think of myself as a glow worm. <laughs> In life, it's a lot more 
impressive if you find out your good qualities from other people and you don't bring them forth yourself. I'm making fun of our false humilities, um, but deep down, um, sometimes we want more credit than we realize. Deep down, he's put eternity in our hearts. And there's something deep down in each one of you that wants your life to count. Your life needs to count. God's put that in you, that you make a difference in your life. That's a fact. How we do that, people try all different ways to make a difference. Some can do it through striving and service, philanthropy. Um, some people do it through business. You make a lot of money. If I have a lot of money, then I can give away a lot of money. That's what's behind it all. And we do a lot of stuff. We, we stress and strain sometimes. But ultimately, the issue is where each one of us is with Christ. I think about this often. I have an uncle that retired as a lieutenant general in the Air Force. Very influential man. He knew President Johnson when Lyndon Johnson going way back. And he's gone now. And the only thing that matters is not whether he was a three-star general or a war hero. What matters is where he is with the Lord. I can't emphasize that enough because every one of us will one day give an account for our life to make a difference. And Jesus makes it very clear how you do that. And it isn't fun. He says, pick up your cross and deny yourself and follow me. There are a lot of people that won't do that. Because if you're not following him, you're following something else. And then he adds to that, he says, you want to be my disciple? He said, lose your life. How many of you know that God is really mean? And his goal in your life is to make you miserable. His goal is to take away all your toys so you don't have any fun. Actually, it's polar opposite. He made you with that zest for life and the reason you're living, but it only works right and correctly when he's in the midst of it all. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. It's really important that we understand that. I can speak from experience. I've had some amazing experiences in my life. You know, I, I won't go over all of them, things we've done. I've done that I don't think I ever would have done if I was an attorney in Northern Virginia living in a nice house, uh, doing something else. It was like God, when God, when I gave my life to him, so to speak, he gave it back to me in a lot of different ways. And I've had tremendous experiences, adventures, manly experiences, and some of you have had the same, and your friendships, and we wouldn't have each other today without something having happened to each one of us in God. That's another amen, so be it. I think it's important to realize this morning that even though you're uniquely special to God, there's a lot of people in the Bible that don't even have a name. Before church this morning, I went to the worship team and I said, hi, guitar player. I said, hi, drummer, how are you? I said, hi, singer. And it's, it's offensive because we're close. We should know each other's name. Well, God certainly knows your name, but in the Bible... There are so many people that accomplish so much and we don't even know who they are. We never got their name. I was thinking of Gideon. Who's Gideon's 300. Name one name of those 300 men. Anybody know? These guys, they had an army of 22,000 going up against an army of hundreds of thousands. And they were handpicked, 22,000 Israelites. And God says to Gideon, too many. 
and he whacks out, um, whacks it all the way down to 10,000. 12,000 people go home. And he looks at the, and then Gideon says, how's that, basically? God said, no. He whacks them again all the way down to 300. 300 men, and if you read in the scriptures, over 100,000 people were slaughtered in this battle with Gideon, Gideon winning. He is truly an example of with one you put 1,000 to flight, with two you put 10,000. But who were these guys? Did they have a 25-year reunion talking about the old days? <laughs> Remember when we took out the Midianites? That was something else, Simeon. Yeah, it sure was. They, I mean, these are real people, just like you. What happened in the upper room? Who were they? There's these Jewish people that were following Jesus, and they went into a prayer meeting. There's a few named, the apostles, and Mary was with them, and a couple of others. But all the rest, on the day of Pentecost, when tongues of fire came down on their heads, and they spoke in new, new tongues, nobody knows who they are. Nobody knows what they did in the early church. There's no record of that. Their significance was in the time they lived. Our significance is in the time we're living now. What's the name of the Sycrophoenician woman? Does anyone know who that is? She was trying to get help for her daughter who was ill. And Jesus chastised her because he came first to the house of Israel. And she says, well, even... Uh, the dogs get the crumbs from the table and then Jesus said such faith I have not seen in all of Israel we don't know what her name is I think it's Debbie because <laughs> in the Bible when you hear the Sycrophoenician how many have ever thought that the woman at the well had a name no I was thinking about it honestly think, when I get to heaven I said hi I'm Kevin Davenport oh hi I'm the woman at the well you're the woman at the well <laughs> Yeah, yeah, what's your name? Theodosius? Theodosius, so glad to meet you. I preached about you, but I didn't know that's who it was. <laughs> See, they're, what they are is they're just, they're just object lessons to us too much. Amazing. Second Corinthians says, at the heart of the gospel is their unknown yet well-known. Most important person to know me will be the Lord himself. And every person here, when our time is up, will stand before the Lord which, with an audience of one. Ladies, I'm sorry, your husbands won't be there. Maybe you're not sorry, I'm just saying. <laughs> your husband will not be, it won't, you're not going to stand before him as a couple. You're not going to stand, you're going to stand before him as a person, male and female and give an account for the gifts and callings he gave you and what you did with your life. And you were all looking for that well done, good and faithful servant. So I want to read today out of, um, let's see, out of Mark, um, beginning in verse 46, 1046. And I want to talk about a nobody that really is somebody and how God, the God that you serve, I mean, I love the bigness of God, you know, and the world and all that. And sometimes we go to a lot of effort to make things look really cool. And I like that too, even. But when it gets right down to it, our Savior came in a manger among a bunch of animals. No fog machines in the manger. Sorry for whoever's feelings I just hurt. And he, he was born with just his husband and wife there. Shepherds weren't there yet. They came later. By the way, he didn't even, they didn't have room for him. This is God Almighty in the flesh. That ought to be a clue, something of God looking for us in our own need for recognition and trust with him. So he says this with Bartimaeus. Then they came to Jericho, and he was leaving Jericho with his disciples, and a large crowd, it says a multitude in Luke. So I'm figuring this would probably be hundreds, probably close to a thousand or more coming in to Jericho. 
And a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road. Okay, let's just think, let's get a mental picture. Close your eyes, please. And imagine them never opening up. For the rest of your life, this is what you see. He's blind. Okay, you can open it. The only thing he could come up with was a beggar. How many of you think um, well, Bartimaeus means son of Timaeus. How many of you think um, Tim, uh, Father Tim, Tim says, you know what? When you grow up, I want you to be a beggar. I want you to be a blind beggar by the road. What in the, but there's something going on here. He's, he's making us know that Timaeus had a father. Bar, son of Timaeus. We just see a blind beggar like we've seen in pictures, you know, dirty by the road, alms for the poor, alms for the... This was a man that had an origin just like you had an origin. He is adding value in this story by telling us who his family is. How did the father feel about that? How did the mother feel about that, that their son is a blind beggar? I mean, these were Jewish people. They knew the covenant. How did this happen? That when the baby was born, we were all rejoicing. How did this happen? I don't know, but there's something getting ready to happen. Something getting ready to happen that's just amazing. What happens is, beginning in verse 47, when he heard that Jesus the Nazarene, he be, uh, that it was Jesus the Nazarene, he began, now remember, it's pitch dark to him. He can't see anything, he's just hearing. He began to cry out and say, Jesus, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Fred, can you hear me? Jesus. Okay, so then the disciples come up and sternly warn him, say, shut up. Church people got up and said, shut up, you're wrecking the parade. Don't you understand that this is Jesus coming in now? We're going to put him on a donkey in a few moments and he's going to come in. Barnabas was a nobody. As far as I know, he never went to college. He never was student of the month. He was a nobody in the sense he had a father but I'm sure Timothy, Timaeus, didn't have him grow up to be a blind beggar. I don't know if he was born from birth that way. I don't know if he got a disease and lost his eyesight. But son of Timaeus is to emphasize his humanity and add to the singular nature of God's mercy. God knows everyone here by name. You may not think about that much. But that's a big deal. I'm t I can be really bad with names, and I'm sure I've done it with you. I had a friend in college. We were sitting in a booth in a, like a hamburger joint, and this guy came, came in that always called my friend by his name, which happened to be Tim. And he'd go up and say, hey, Tim, how you doing? And he could never remember his name. So he'd go, hey, buddy, what's up? You doing good? Hey, brother. Brother works, too, for Christians. You can't, <laughs> you can't remember his name. And so I was sitting there, and I said, he said, Kevin, Kevin, what's that guy's name? I said, I think it's Dave. And he goes, oh, good. So the guy comes up and says, hey, Tim. He says, hey, Dave, how you doing? How you doing? Well, his name is actually Tom. <laughs> so <laughs> after they had known each other, I didn't do it on purpose, but <laughs> it makes a difference if people know your name. People want, that's what I'm talking about, significance. Let God be true in every man alive. The God knows your name. He knew you before the foundations of the earth. And he knows you're going out and you're coming in. He knows before I speak what I'm going to say. He knows the thoughts and intentions of my heart. The disciples are trying to get him to be quiet. 
And then the children came up to Jesus that same day. The disciples had a rough day. The, the children had gathered around Jesus too and the, trying to get rid of him. And Jesus rebuked the disciples and said, Suffer the little children to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of God. They had also had an argument about marriage, what it took to be legally married after the de- the, talking about the responsibilities of widows and mar- excuse me, and marriage and such things as that. So they'd had an argument about that. They also had the rich young ruler come up that day. And he said, uh, you know, what must I do to be saved? And he looks at this guy. We would have made him an elder. We put him on Christian television. We would have given him a book contract. He was that talented. Good looking guy with a lot of money. And Jesus said, well, one thing you lack, sell everything that you own and come follow me. That's kind of a gets right to the crux. And it said he owned many things. So we have to ask ourselves, how much do we own we can't let go of? Some people take it literally. I believe it was spoken to that man specifically, but as an object lesson for all of us, that nothing should own us. He had many possessions, but in reality, his possessions had him. That very same day, Jesus foretold his death, that he'd be crucified, scourged, beaten, and betrayed. That same day, the disciples didn't get it. Peter took him aside privately and rebuked Jesus. He said, you cannot go to the cross. This is not the plan. At that same day, James and John's mother came to Jesus in front of the ten and said she'd like to have her boys sit on the right and the left hand of the king when the kingdom is manifested. I put in my notes, that is like a mother at a high school going to the head coach on the game day and saying, I want my boy to start at quarterback. It was a picture of, uh, it caused great consternation among the disciples. Uh, The other ten were not indignant, they were extremely indignant. So what happens with Peter in this? Peter felt like he had been left out, that James and John had done an end run. Peter was on the mountain of Mount uh, Transfiguration. He was there when Jairus' daughter was raised from the dead. He was the one who walked on water only to get out of the boat. The others didn't. Certainly he should have a special seat, not James and John. Peter's the one that said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Flesh and blood has revealed this to you, not... And my, my, father, uh, my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Flesh and blood has, not revealed, has revealed that to you, but my Father's in heaven. This great revelation came to Peter before the others, but they were trying to edge him out. As we come to the table today, I want you to remember that the disciples were very human. When is the last time you didn't get proper credit for something you did? And it led to a pout fest. (laughs) Why don't people do, you know, why does that person? Sometimes I think it actually happens to us to test our heart. What are we really in this for? I mean, recognition is a good thing. But sometimes it reveals self-serving motives. So let me finish the story. In the midst of it, Jesus stopped and said, call him here. He stopped a crowd, a big crowd, a multitude for one blind beggar. He stopped. The Son of God, the Word made flesh, the Alpha and the Omega stopped. This man diverted the momentum and intensity of the crowd. One person. Barnabas was not only persistent, but he was in unbelievable despair. I will say this, some of you know what I'm talking about, and some of you will know what I'm talking about. There comes a time in almost every person's life when despair reaches a point, I think I can barely go on. That's when you become Bartimaeus. That's when he knows you by name, and that's when you cry out to him. You'll hear, he hears you. Come here, what do you, and then we'll finish. This is very interesting as you read the story. The disciples who had rebuked him for yelling now said, 
come, the master will, would like to see you. And they're real nice to him. We can be very hypocritical. They told him to take courage, but he didn't need courage. Bartimaeus didn't need courage. He was bold and humble, but he was desperate. It says, casting aside his cloak, he jumped up and came to Jesus. Why is that in the Bible? Bo, why do you think it's in the Bible? That doesn't need to be in the Bible, casting aside your cloak, jumped up. Okay, but let's think about it. How many of you think he had a bath every day? If you've ever been around homeless people or gone to uh, inner city rescue missions or had someone in your car, the odor doesn't leave for two or three days. That cloak probably was damp, nasty, dank, and he's just sitting there by the side of the road. They're not paved, by the way. I don't know if it was dusty that day. I don't know what it was. But he's sitting. Everybody else is standing and walking, and then... He's yelling over a crowd. It's an amazing thing he did. And it says, it goes on to say this. Jesus stopped and said, call him here. So they called the blind man, saying to him, take courage, stand up. He's calling for you. Throwing aside his cloak, he jumped up and came to Jesus. And answering him, Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? Now, I want to stop there, too. That that's a big Question. You need to, we all need to ask ourselves, what do you want God to do for you? I don't even know if we even ask that question. I think sometimes we know what we don't like in life. I don't want to do, I don't want to do this. People, all of us are really good at saying, I don't want to do that. But what do you want God to do for you? Secondly, why did the Lord even ask the question? The guy's blind. What do you think he wanted? He said, uh, you know, and he says, what do you want me to do for you? He made him, requ he required something of him. Yelling was not enough. You need to, he asked and we need to respond. Lord, I want wisdom for my children or grandchildren. Lord, I want to be whatever you had in mind when you made me. What do you want? Or someone here, too, has been plagued with ongoing things in your family, an extended family. In that case, it's like, Lord, I want them to receive sight, and I want to share that with them. And Jesus says, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Your faith has saved you. The blind beggar, Bartimaeus, was no longer blind. And I doubt that he remained a beggar. How many of you remember reading about Bartimaeus in the book of Acts? All the amazing things he did. He's not in there. He's there. This is three days before Jesus was crucified. Or the week that Jesus was crucified. So this man... Is, and it says he followed him, so he came in on the triumphal entry when Jesus sat upon a colt. And he was there after Jesus was crucified, and like others was wondering what's going on, and then the resurrection comes, and then he's there at the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and I guarantee you, I, Bartimaeus, make me look good when I get to heaven. I know this man did something in God. But I'm going to tell you, there's no therapist, there's no counselor, there's no college, there's nothing that could get him out of the jam he was in. It was hopeless. He's blind and he's a beggar. He has nothing, nothing, no future. And he throws that cloak away. He's never going to put that one back on like that. And now he's this amazing person with an amazing story. I wrote in my notes, how many of you think he was a nominal Christian after that? Barnabas says, I should go to church more often. <laughs> I really should. I need to take serious my faith. This man was touched by God. Had he not been touched by God, I don't know what his future was along the side of the road. 
He got an audience with the living God. Nobody gets passed over who seeks the Lord. Everybody is a somebody to God. When we finish our time here on earth, that'll be the most important thing. The most important thing will be that he knows your name. And he really does. He calls you by name. In fact, in Revelation, he's got a new name planned for you. I don't know what it is. Mine's going to be Sonny. <laughs> when I'm in heaven, God will say, come here, I got a new name for you, Kevin. It's going to be Sonny. No, it's going to be something really spiritual and heavy. Like, son of my right hand, fool with the spirit of God, come here. <laughs> you get a new name, but you come, he knows who you are. The next time you sink, the next time you feel like the world's falling apart around you, think of Bartimaeus and let's get in touch with him. Now this takes faith, not, not, not just understanding through your ears. We need faith. So we're going to have communion, which is a memorial meal. Jesus said, as often as you do this, you do this in memory of me. So Jesus is not opposed to memorials. And I think the memorials around our country and other countries, um, I think they have a real value to stir up our memories. There's nothing about that that really bothers me at all. Because memory, um, I don't know the future, I just have memories of what's already happened. And your memory gives your life meaning. When you see someone that's lost their memory, it's a sad thing because they have no context anymore. And it takes a lot of love to walk someone through that kind of thing. But memory is a gift from God, and, and so a memorial is a gift from God.
Hallelujah, Lord. You are seated on the throne. And you are alive, Lord. Worthy is 